says. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody, and happy International Women's Day. So we still have some little time, but um, yeah, it's very exciting to be here on stage. We hope that everything is working and that you can see us uh, everywhere where we want to stream this morning. So today we are on the stage, more or less all of us. So let's put a kind of uh, um, see you very soon, starting in some kind of one minute. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, a wonderful International Women's Day. Here we are on the stage, and I'm taking a look at LinkedIn, and I see that we are here, we are live, and it's a very exciting day that we want to celebrate with you. And uh, for that, we have uh, prepared a wonderful video that I would like to show you, and I hope it works and uh, provide us a little bit of mood of our topic of today, which is the new phase of new leaders. For me, leadership means to be your authentic self, to sometimes take a risk because we all make mistakes and only if you be your true self, you can be a good leader. That's what I think. To me, leadership is all about motivation and setting a path to reach goals together. For me, leadership isn't something what comes with a certain position or a certain hierarchy level. For me, it's an attitude how you see your role in life. Leadership for me is about inclusion. It's about putting yourself in other people's shoes. It's about understanding the other. It's about communication. Leadership for me is about humanity. Leadership today is about inspiring people. It's about bringing people together. It's about collaboration. It's about inclusivity. For me, leadership means lifting other people, helping other people, supporting other people, and um, empowering them to bring out the best talents they bring with them. And for me, leadership is uh, less about rank and seniority and more about being the leader that you feel you need and that people around you may need so that you make sure that you take everyone on your team on the same journey. So <clears throat> today is everything about inspiring inclusion. This is the topic of the International Women's Day of 2024. We are now though, this year in a new situation, in a complex world, and in a realization that diversity is an imperative for everyone in our business life, in our normal life, in a personal and business perspective. With our workforce and a clientele becoming increasingly diverse, leaders across industries are recognizing the imperative for building inclusive organizations as an imperative of their competitiveness. And the evidence speak for themselves because inclusive cultures outperform the market in terms of financial performance and innovation. Yet despite our progress, one diversity challenge remains persistently elusive. Women are underrepresented in top leadership roles. So what's preventing us for cracking the code on achieving gender equality in leadership. <clears throat> to mark the International Women's Day, we at net for tech we want to tackle this issue and the fantastic group we have today from around the world 
joining us and sharing the knowledge, their experiences and the best practices. So this is an essential discussion we want to run today in order to inspire you, to empower you and to enable you to come into action and make things happen. Let's go through our day. I'm here today with my partners in crime of net for tech Angelique, Angelique Mesh, part of the executive board, and uh, Katerina Andreeva, also part of the Global Ambassadors. We three are going to be the master of ceremony for the next two hours we want to spend with you. And uh, with a very um, exciting agenda and exceptional humans joining us today. Maybe to make it a little bit more clear, we are going to have three keynote speakers. Uh, Manuela speaking about uh, the uh, um, impact of uh, an uh, inclus inclusive culture in companies. Tunde, just providing us from his experience, what does it mean to inspire children to become the leaders of tomorrow? He's going to join from Nigeria. Manuela joining from Lisbon this morning, very early. Thank you for being here. Annabelle is going to close the keynote speakers uh, round with uh, an uh, inspiring talk about uh, how can uh, leadership really have a great impact if we focus on changing culture and working from ourselves, but toward the teams and organizations. And we are going to have two panel discussions one crucial one, which is a uh, focus on how to shape a new narrative of women in technology. And the second one, really focusing on the topic of intersectional leadership. And having said that, I would like to pass the uh, um, voice to Angelique, who is going to present uh, net for tech and why we are here, who we are. And um, for sure, I'm coming back to that, but uh, we invite you to be very interactive today in the chat, in all the channels, you are now joining us in order to uh, uh, bring your thoughts, your ideas, or your questions uh, to the experts in the morning. So, Angelique, welcome to the stage. So, as Begonia just said, one thing that becomes more and more evident or is also quite present um, is that women are underrepresented in technical roles, women are underrepresented in many different types of roles in the corporate world, also in the public entities, like in governmental institution and politics and so on. But one of the things that we know the most is that today, in the year 2024, women have never been as highly qualified um, ever before, right? So together, we need to figure out how to close this gender gap. How can we penetrate and be more present in the corporate world, also in governmental institutions and in other roles, right? How can we all come together and empower each other and engage with each other and really lift each other up? With that being said, Margaret Albright said, you know, women that don't lift and support other women, um, there's a special place for these women in hell. So it's also important to recognize the power of how coming together as um, peers and supporting each other, and we need to move away from the elbow behavior and, and, and being competitors, right? We see that with the little, with the, the big men's club, they do that the same, and we as women need to come together and support each other. And that's why networks like net for tech um, are relevant because they allow you to come together as a team to learn from each other, to get inspired, and also to obtain new opportunities that may Maybe you didn't realize you had before, right? Um, so if we move to the next page. Um, that's what we do at net for tech We we are a community, a strong community of different women and many different types of um, seniority level that come together and basically exchange on different um, subject matter expert topics like uh, digital technology. Where is the innovation going forward there? For example, machine learning, AI. But at the same time, we connect on the personal level, talking about um, what challenges we incur currently at work, um, where we need potentially some growth areas. We offer coaching, we offer trainings, and so on. And most importantly, what we also do at Net4Tech is we give you a stage, right? 
a stage. What does that mean? It means that um, you go, if, if it's something you want to do, you can go to different events and share your story. Because one thing that we think is, oh yeah, you know, am I really that great? Do I really have something to share? But we see that regardless of how big or small, there's always a contribution to be made and there's always someone to be inspired, right? So you don't have to be a CEO. You don't have to be an executive or anything to inspire and, and spark a new energy at, um, at, with somebody else, right? And that's quite important to, to understand. And that's what we do at net for tech And as you can see, we've been present in many different events, such as um, in the Web Summit in Lisbon. We've been with Firmworks. We've been at, um, we're working together with Panda. We've been at her career. We're also doing um, a, a C-suite dinner meetings um, once a quarter. So there's a lot um, where we go to and where we're present. And um, that makes us unique. We give you a stage, we provide you with visibility, and we bring you together because we believe that together we're strong and we can drive innovation through diversity, through inclusion, we can make a difference. Yeah. And that's what we do with the new face of leadership campaign. As you can see here, we have many different women, but also men, because inclusion is not only about female empowerment, it's about um, bringing men, men along the journey, being equal, and also um, empowering men to be inclusive in the sense of, you know, taking maternity leave as well, right? Making that a new normality, like in Sweden, empowering men to say, no, I will stay at home today because the child is, is ill, or just empowering meant to say, hey, you know what? My my wife is an executive, super cool. Let's go. What can I do? Right. So it's about empowering everybody in the in the spectrum to just be equal. And then maybe one day we won't have to use the word um, diversity, equity, and inclusion anymore because it's just not needed, right? Um, yeah. And that being said, Begonia, I'll pass on to you. Yeah. Thank you, Angelique, for presenting about who we are and why we are here today. We believe that we definitely need a new culture of leaders who understand diversity, equity, and inclusion as a super booster for innovation and growth. And this is the movement we have created with the name The New Face of Leadership. And this is also the title of our um, event today. And um, having said that, we have the first uh, uh, speaker of the day who is uh, Manuela. Let's uh, bring Manuela to the stage. I hope it works. And um, let's make a little bit of space so that we have Manuela on the stage. Wonderful, I think it works. And um, in the time we bring Manuela, I would like to introduce these wonderful women I met in Lisbon. Um, here you are. Hi, Manuela. Hi. <laughs> Introducing you and saying this is an amazing uh, uh, venue. We can uh, be together again. Um, we met each other in Lisbon in 2000, 2021. And uh, since then, it's like uh, uh, falling in love at the first time because it's the uh, the same mindset, the same mission, and the same understanding. And um, you are not only a best fan of crime, I could imagine. You have been an inspiration anytime we come together. With uh, a uh, trilingual and multicultural technology uh, background, being a global director with over 23 years of experience in digital transformations, your core competence lies on building successful partnership. And also, you have a passion for leverage technology for good. I know you as a humanist leader with the superpower of resolving complex issues and advocating for diversity, inclusion, and mental health. Thank you for being here. And um, I provide you the stage to speak Thank about you. how important it is to Thank you. unlock the power of inclusivity. Thank you Thank so you. much, Tanya. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to start International Women's Day being here on this floor. So first of all, I want to make sure you can actually hear me because I can see my image is frozen. Your image is frozen, but I can hear you and I can see okay. you. Let's see. All right, that's okay. So uh, as Angelique said, quoting Madeleine Albright, Women don't help women have a very special place in hell. 
But equally, women and anyone, women and men alike, who help women, though, will have a very special place in history. Thank you, thank you for being here today. Um, as Angelique just showed, when more women work, economies grow. Women's economic empowerment increases economic diversification and income equality for shared prosperity. The United Nations Women's Agency is, a, is an entity that is dedicated to gender equality and empowerment of women. We just saw that in, in, in Europe, if we add more women, we're talking about 300 extra billion uh, euros into the economy. It is also estimated that closing the gender gap could give the global economy an extra 7 trillion boost uh, dollars into the economy. We say that women's economic equality is good for business. Companies greatly benefit from increasing employment and leadership opportunities for women, which is shown in the increasing organizational effectiveness and growth. We are told that companies with three or more in senior women in senior management functions score higher in all dimensions of organizational performance. Now, we've all heard this, we've read this, but what I find often when we talk about diversity and inclusion being uh, good for business, these numbers are so big that people can't really see what it means for them in their own business. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the business case, really, for uh, having more women to the workplace. What does it actually mean for a company? So let's start by going back one stage, um, one step. If you think about any business, any business starts with a new idea for a new product or new service, either for a need that exists in society or sometimes by creating a need uh, uh, into society. So that's the innovative part. If you think that half of the world's population are women, and, and let's face it, the other half are actually their children, uh, what this means is whatever, unless you're in a very niche product, uh, for example, shirts for men, uh, the majority of products and services are going to serve women as well in the marketplace. So in the innovation teams, you need to have women thinking alongside men to make sure that whatever we invent uh, and then we develop and produce is actually going to be suitable and working for uh, women as well. At that point in time, when you go into production, again, whether we're talking about factories in you know, producing uh, um, objects or, or products or services in the services industry, and that includes technology as well, once again, in all this process, it is really important to have things that are developed and tested uh, for, for, for women equally as for men. And who says women and who says men? We're also talking about black people. We're also talking about Indian people. We're also talking people from different races and different backgrounds and different uh, sexual orientations, etc. This is what called the market. The market are people like you and I who are consumers, customers uh, for, for our organizations. And then when you go to marketing and sales, same thing. You know, campaigns that you see that are very much focused. I often talk about the automotive industry. Um, you know, automotive industry is a very male industry. And yet... Um, most uh, people who, who drive are both men and women. So it would make sense that when you're actually advertising for cars, you're actually advertising for women driving cars as well, uh, and not a very sometimes misogynistic view uh, of cars. Um, once you've done the sales, uh, it's very important, including, by the way, in the negotiations, but once you've done the sales, you need to start thinking about after sales, uh, the customer experience, the customer satisfaction, the experience they have with your product, with your service. So we're now talking about implementation, we're talking about customer management, and also we're talking about building customer loyalty. So this is anything to do with the competition. Um, you know, we you know we want to make sure that we, we the customers are so happy with whatever we've presented to them that actually they want to buy more of whatever else range we're going to bring into the market. And last but not least, in all of this, whether you're a small uh, or medium business or whether you're a large corporation, the company's management, again, needs to reflect whether it's on the resource side, whether it's on the business side, whether it's on the managers, the leaders, the C-level, everybody needs to represent, you know, the market. So this is when you start thinking then in terms of business and customers. Um, you know, often when you think about the products and the services that we've come up with, um, and, and we often, for those of us who are in the corporate world, for example, we want to talk to the C-level, the CEO, the CFO, the CIO, the C whatever O. Uh, if you think about it, um, you know, it's, do we even know what it's like to be one of those C-level people if we haven't been one of those ourselves? 
um, you know, think about it. We often forget to put ourselves in the shoes of our customers. Do we know what it's like to receive a new payment cash system, you know, when, you know, and, and something goes wrong and we haven't been in a cash system payment or we're not responsible for paying salaries? Uh, for example, I, I talk about this because in the technology world, we were just testing now how things going to work. Sometimes when things don't work, it can go really wrong. And we often don't empathize, you know, with our customers enough to understand how bad things can go. For example, when we develop technology or products for a hospital, uh, we, we come up with fancy products or services saying, oh, this is how more efficient your hospital could be. When was the last time you went to a state hospital in the emergency room and actually see what's going on there with all the humans, doctors, nurses, cleaners, everything is going on there. Same thing about factories. We often come up with CRM systems that make it more efficient to know what's going on from the factory to the seaboard level, et cetera. But I often think, when was the last time or ever somebody was in a factory? Uh, so you can see where I'm going with all this. You know, how can we un uh, understand whether it's business to business or business to consumer or customers if we are not like them, if we don't think like them, if we don't look like them, if we don't feel like them? And, and the, the point here is if you don't do this, you know, because some people say, yeah, yeah, no, I'm fine. But we know and I'm not going to cite the companies, but you, you can go and find out by yourself. Uh, there was a, a very famous company that does beauty products um, and their marketing team, uh, for those of us who live in Europe, most women like to have darker skin to look like they're tanned in the sun. And they thought this would work really well in Asia. So off they went without even researching or having people in their team from the Asian market selling powders to make the, the skin darker. And guess what? It was a complete disaster. Why? Because women, you know, uh, in those places want to have a lighter skin, not a darker skin. Um, there was also uh, a couple of companies, very famous ones, technology companies, and not only one, one that actually did soap dispensers. They developed products and applications that simply did not uh, work on darker schemes because nobody in that innovation or production line or the testing team actually had dark skin or had thought that maybe dark skins would work with those types of, uh, of products. There was also a very famous uh, company that came up with a fantastic health app and, uh, and they measured everything from not just the, the blood rate, uh, the fat, the water, the bones, the heart rate, you name it. They, they measured everything in the body except they forgot to measure the period. And uh, it's not something we choose to have, unfortunately. So uh, this was when it came to the market, you can imagine half of the population not being able to measure the period because that does affect everything else in your hormones and everything else. Um, and then sometimes these things uh, are actually quite serious. So until about five to 10 years ago, most automotive companies did not test seat belts on women's bodies, which meant that more women died in car crashes, not because they can't drive, simply because the seat belt was not adapted to their bodies. And last but not least, if you think about um, medicine, all of us take medicine at some stage in our lives. If you actually start reading the labels in there, it talks about children. It talks about over 12 year olds. It talks about women when they're pregnant and they're breastfeeding. But then do you really believe that that pill is going to have the same effect in a body that is different from, from men's bodies, uh, considering that most drugs are actually tested mostly on men? So you can, you can see what these mistakes, how much it can cost, not just to companies, but actually to people's lives if you take it to the other extreme. This is why we say it's so important to have women and other people represented in organizations in every single level of it. Now, obviously, you know, this in the, in the day and uh, DNA of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence is brilliant. It can really help us, you know, uh, do our jobs much better. But at the same time, when you have biases in the in the in the in the humans, then the artificial intelligence is going to have that as well. So uh, this is, and, and then if you look at the organizations, just to finish on this, because I know we don't have a lot of time this morning. Um, you know, when when you think about the lack of representation in leadership. Uh, what happens, and studies after studies show this, people get disconnected. We talk about the great resignation. We talk about the lack of motivation, lack of productivity, lack of innovation. Uh, there is, and it's no surprise that at the moment we live almost in this permanent crisis mode of economic, social, environmental, political. Why? Because the people at the top are not representing the people. This is not a political statement. This is actually a reality of it. We need a different type of leadership. We need a different type of management and economic system where it's actually coming by the people, with the people, for the people. And in this case, with women, you know, very much uh, in there. 
So um, uh, on this point, you know, uh, what we want, we don't want, and I think this is a, a final point I wanted to make on this as well, is that when we say we want more women uh, as leaders, uh, it doesn't mean that we want to replace men. It's not that at all. We all have feminine and masculine characteristics, and that's great. Uh, they're not weaknesses. They're not qualities. These are just characteristics that we have. Being direct, being focused, being controlled, being logical, being all these things are good and we like it. But if you only have this in society or in business, that's 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 just very much one way and it's not good. Uh, we need people who are empathetic, receptive, vulnerable, flexible, adaptive, intuitive, giving, caring. If you're just that, you're also can't carry on with business. So we want the balance. That's what we want. Um, and then, and what this means when you have female leadership and more women into the workplace, what we mean is we think about union instead of competition. We're talking about real transformation as, as opposed to more of the same with a different flavor. We're thinking long term instead of short term. We're thinking about all the impact on the economic system. And, um, and so we're very much talking about the growth mindset instead of uh, a fixed mindset. So. It's about using intuition. It's about listening to our customers. It's about dialoguing and talking to them. It's about innovating. It's about building bridges to reach a consensus. It's about fighting for greater equity for everyone, for greater justice, for greater sustainability. Ultimately, from a business perspective, it's about better serving our customers, the businesses, and the markets. So for me, this is really about liberating women and men from the traditional outdated ways of being in business, in leadership, and in life. Fantastic. Thank you so much for these very inspiring and very uh, yeah, fact-driven um, keynote. Manuela, it's an open eye, and I think uh, more and more we are very conscious what does it mean to uh, just think in a monoculture and think only if one perspective when we are shaping our world. And this is our perspective as well at Dead for Tech. And this is why we are so much focusing on promoting diversity in the technology world because we are now shaping the future thanks to the technology. And we definitely need to have more women um, taking an active part on this development. Um, we are now of the time, I'm following and I see we are almost 200 people following uh, this amazing discussion and uh, taking this um, first inspiration for your part and facts from your part, Manuela, thank you so much. I would like to invite Angelique to come into the stage and uh, present the next panel where we are going to tackle more in detail how to shape a new narrative of women in technology that really allows us to disrupt the status quo you have presented today and leverage the impact of this inclusive culture, which is so necessary, like you mentioned, Manuela, to reach parity, to reach equality, to reach inclusion and belonging. So thank you so much for being here today, Manuela. I'm so sorry, you're, uh, yeah, you're frozen right now, but we can, it's we, can, okay. <laughs> we can hear you. This is the most important thing. We can hear you. So thank you for being here. So stay with us. And then uh, we are going to, to be all on the loop, continuing this discussion. Angelique, go ahead. Thank you. So, yeah, and I think um, with that being said, that topic is shaping a new narrative of women in technology, um, taking into, into account what you just said. And um, this topic is going to be hosted by Stefan. Stefan is, um, works at Accenture, is a big ambassador of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also of net for tech And we're quite excited to welcome him on stage and um, let him take over. All. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be to be here today facilitating this panel discussion and without further ado I will uh, introduce um, my three panelists on with whom we are going to um, explore how we can drive uh, the new narrative of, of diversity so I'd like to introduce first uh, Asun um, <coughs> who is a uh, um, uh, the, the CIO at uh, Medida uh, Spanish Life Insurance. She's based uh, in Madrid and she comes with a statement saying that diversity brings uh, to companies different ways of thinking and, a, and, a, and an enriching strategic vision. So, uh, glad to have you, Asun. Uh, 
I'd like to introduce also Boris. Uh, Boris is an independent consultant, is uh, based in Frankfurt, and uh, he says um, diversity enriches our organizations by weaving the various thread of, uh, of social and economic wells. And then I also would like to introduce Erika. And Erika is a head of focus area on social, social uh, technical systems in Cornell, um, based in uh, New York. And uh, her statement is that diversity is a driver for innovation. So what we see here is a, a social and economic impact, innovation, and strategic vision. Without um, Without further ado, um, coming back to uh, the, the statement we have seen before, at around 22%, uh, the proportion of women working in the a, in a, in a technology field in Europe is not really increasing, and, and the percentage is even lower in leadership positions. So how can we really drive the change? Um, my first question goes to, um, to Asun. Um, from your point of view, what are the specific challenges which uh, women are facing in a leading role in, in technology. So can you bring maybe a personal story on this one? Thanks, Stefano. Well, in my opinion, the main problem uh, we women have faced in the world technology is that our presence has always been very small and we have had to move in environments dominated almost entirely by men. Uh, if you ask me, there are, uh, uh, in my opinion, there are two main challenges that women has to face today if they want to lead a role in technology. One challenge is uh, after university or even before, uh, and is how to acquire these technical skills and how to receive the adequate coaching to start to grow at the beginning of our career, uh, professional career. And secondly, the, the other challenge, important challenge for me, is how to get women to influence, to transform, and make things happen once we are growing in our organizations. Uh, at this point, I, I would like to share with you two very different experiences in my personal professional career uh, because I have moved between Latin America, Spain, and, and other countries, so that could be very, very uh, interesting. Uh, many years ago, maybe six, seven years ago, I, I was working in Latin America, completely in Mexico, where, as you know, the, the, the inclusion of women in the, in the labor market has always been a pending issue. In Mexico, uh, in, in this opportunity, I have the opportunity to work with uh, the World Bank and with one of the most uh, important banks, commercial bank in, in Mexico, in a very interesting project. Okay. The aim of this project was to, to help women of a very low social class to get out of poverty and reduce the gender equality gap. And how was it approached? Okay, this is the, the, the interesting part. Well, the World Bank, uh, through some specific researches, noticed that women were much better at the manager finance than men. So uh, with this project, the idea was to provide not only microcredit to women that wanted to start a small business, but also incorporate financial and legal advice uh, to start to create these, these new companies and training in interpersonal skills and consulting services to help them to get there. Okay, it was very, very interesting. The second, the second experience that I would like to, to, to share with you, and it's a very total different uh, experience, was in Spain. And in this case, this is the first time that I, I, I was part uh, of a steering committee as technology director. Okay, uh, it was a, in, a, in a Spanish company. And at the beginning, for me, it was very difficult that the committee members value my work and took my ideas and vision into account. So what did I do or try to do? Okay, <laughs> well, as usual, no? as usual in my previous uh, position, I had to work very, very hard to demonstrate my capabilities. Um, but thanks to, to my personal skills, because I am a very assertive person and because I am not afraid to make decisions first in my IT department, and second, uh, share innovative ideas in the steering committee, I got it. Finally, I remember that uh, the, the salespeople usually asked me to go with them to the commercial meetings because I was able to quickly understand the customer needs. So for me, and in summary, um, in my opinion, one challenge so is how to motivate and coach women to get technological skills, and second is how to demonstrate our capabilities during 
our professional career without having to have this traditional effort. Thanks so much, Asun, on um, <clears throat> on your personal story. So I, I would like to uh, to turn to um, to Erica to bring her perspective uh, and maybe also to uh, to react <clears throat> on the on the two points raised by Asun about the necessity to provide to receive training and uh, to demonstrate capabilities by being more assertive. Erica, you've yeah. on that. No, no, thanks for having me. Um, I'm also following along in the chat and there's some great discussion going on there as well. Um, so, you know, to bring my own perspective, I, you know, being an academic, you can get a bit, you know, academic about these things and uh, in term, and so I'm gonna lend a little bit of that perspective with how I respond. And um, several years ago, um, I uh, wrote a paper about um, how women, in, from a systems perspective, actually go into leadership positions straight from their education, uh, then and then following that pipeline up, and then why we're seeing drop off along the way, um, and this is very country dependent. Uh, so I was looking at this using U.S. data, but you know I've also spent most of my uh, you know adult life in Europe, so. I felt like it was a bit of disconnect of what I was seeing with this, you know, the actual like empiric res results of the study and then my own experience. And so from that, like with the, the training and getting, uh, you know, women into more technical fields in the United States until you get to university has been quite successful in a lot of ways. Uh, but we also then wind up seeing drop off because of the work environment once we get there. And it, it's really all centered around, you know, some of the perspectives that we're hearing from us soon. And then I'm also reading in the chat as well um, about inclusivity. So when you have then a small group of people, uh, like like any minority, right? So then there, there needs to be a tipping point where there's a critical mass where you can start attracting people who are like them. Uh, there, while we all like to be in diverse environments, we also feel very comfortable with people who are like us. And once you then start seeing that critical mass of where we're starting to attract people that, for example, women, but also like any minority then, and you want to build those numbers in leadership, you have to find ways to then, you know, at those critical points in that pipeline to then increase the uh, a, but beyond a certain threshold. So it's about, you know, creating different policies, not policy with a big P uh, necessarily coming from government, but what, what I like to call policy with a little P that is just like in these organizations or universities uh, that then have the ability to increase these numbers at those critical junctions. Um, but I also want to bring up a personal anecdote, um, like to build off of what Asun said. So I have worked a lot in research institutes in, um, in Norway. Uh, uh, and during my time there, I was part of search committees for hiring uh, like um, other researchers at these um, universities or at, at these research institutes. And um, what I found is recognizing my own biases so one of the reasons that we're seeing then, you know, like path dependency in systems to like towards specific demographic groups, so being largely men or, you know, um, you know, one race and ethnicity is because people tend to hire those that like are like them. And I noticed that I was doing almost exactly the same thing. I was looking at candidates and I'm like, wow, OK, she is a foreign woman uh, living in Norway. <laughs> She's very much like me. So I was giving more attention to those candidates uh, that were really had my characteristics. And when I stepped back I, and I looked at this slate of candidates who were all very similar to me, I was really seeing how, you know, the path dependency was working in practice. Uh, and then those then like how you get then that critical mass is then finding, you know, those, uh, you know, small groups that can start to, you know, influence what's going on, but then you have to try and then keep that balance so that we're representing everybody in a very inclusive environment. So I'll leave it there for now, but um, it's quite interesting when you take this from an academic perspective and then you boil that down to your own personal experience, especially in an international 
or like really a global context where you're seeing different environments in, in Europe and the United States. <clears throat> Thanks for this, Erika. Um, when we turn to um, you know to the to the different generations who, who are shaping the new narrative of uh, of uh, of women in, in tech, and when we also turn into uh, the male perspective on uh, how should the, the role also of men be in this uh, in this movement, I'd like to turn to to, to Boris um, and ask you the question. Uh, from your point of view, which differences or which behaviors are you observing in uh, in younger generation women and maybe also men in technology, um, which can um, drive the change that has been uh, described by Asun and, and Erika to uh, reach this critical mass, um, uh, um, change the hiring, be assertive, create attractive environment. So, what are your observations on this topic? Um, thank you for asking. The um... I mean, I run a company with 100 uh, employees, and the um, and the, we are female dominated. The, the the reason for that was, but then I started my company really with the idea that we really want to have a diverse organization, and uh, that leads to the fact that I really had always the emphasis as a from a from a leader point of view that I really need to foster females in their positions, and um, and the, and there are a lot of young uh, women in, in my company and. On one hand side, I really observe that they really understand their new role and they they really know what they know. I mean, they're very well educated and they have university degrees. They 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 work in very male dominant environment. They know exactly how to behave. And on the other hand, I call it my, sometimes the imposter syndrome of women. I mean, they're really good in in what they are doing, but if you want to put them on stage or if you ask them, do you want to have a leadership role? They step back, and not all of, of course. But there is a tendency still in, in um, even in the younger generation, uh, not to take responsibility. No, they want to have the responsibility, but to have these kind of roles to really stay in. I want to be a leader. I want to manage a team. I really want to engage in that. Uh, it's not in their. I wouldn't say it's even in the interest. It is in their interest, but they, they there's a there's a strange neglection of this this of the acceptance of this kind of roles yeah so they're really really intelligent they're really powerful and they know all that but one aspect of their maybe socialization is always saying well i have to be still in the background even if i know all that yeah and, uh, and that's that's the thing that we as um as leaders who want to foster diversity uh really need to to see, I think we, we need to come up with that problem because, as Erica mentioned, we need to have more, much more women in leadership positions. But it's hard to be a, a leader, yeah? and um, and you need to embrace that that responsibility. You, you, you raise a point which is uh, extremely important and has been um, addressed also a couple of uh, uh, in, in several instances about you know the imposter uh, syndrome. Um, I'd like to turn back to uh, either Erika or or Asun um, on on what are the root causes for your from from your perspective about the imposter syndrome and how can uh, can women uh, tackle it and overcome it. Um, if I, I can go ahead and start as soon if you like. Um, I so the imposter syndrome is 100% real. Um, <laughs> I couldn't support what Boris said more. Um, I've you know felt that uh, almost at every single stage of my career. Um, so <laughs> and it was funny because I was telling a like a um, kind of a, an early career professional about this just the other day where. You know, I was noticing in them that they were having imposter syndrome, and this person wasn't um, wasn't a woman; they were a man. But like, it's it's common in all of us of how like you're feeling insecure in the face of like really, it's not knowing the expertise of others and assuming that everybody is much more amazing than you are. And so when I see in my own case of how I more or less accidentally overcome imposter syndrome in the past. And this is what I was telling this, this young man was that really dig deep into like, who are your colleagues? What exactly are their area of expertise? What are they, what are they saying they're experts in? And then what are they actually doing? And so just really gathering data. And, uh, and when this person went and did this and he, let's just say afterwards when he realized that, 
actual competence of those that he felt were so much smarter than him and really were just so much more advanced that he actually not only brought a lot to the table, uh, but in in many cases, like he was able to outperform those that he was at first very intimidated by. So I always give this advice to other women as well, or just really any young professional is go find out what you're actually intimidated by and see where you actually fall in terms of your competency. Thanks so much for that. Um, I, I would like to, um, to now reflect on the, on the different stories and observations that we've done in order to um, to, to now uh, take it from the person, person from the uh, complementarity of, uh, of of men and, and women on the topic, um, how should men uh, better support diversity in technology and, and really act as allies for women's development in, in technology? Um, we, we've we've heard you know what what women should do by themselves, uh, but also how should men support? So what I'd like to hear now is uh, what would be your expectations from you as women versus men and what uh, maybe Boris you know you what you would think you personally as a man can do to act as an ally versus women in technology so I open to you to Boris and then turn to Asun and Erika afterwards to react um, it starts with communication and you need to be very very careful and and and, and cautious about what kind of communication do you uh, um, accept in your organization so as a leader and you really need to understand that that these tiny little ways of of um, um, of putting the, uh, women or even other p uh, uh, groups in, in in a company down is is it's is a communication issue. And you need to be very careful as a, as a leader to and react very fast. So you you are not you, you really need to say okay this was not uh, politically correct to, in in the way you dealt with that specific person. That's one aspect. The other aspect is you need to come up with um, this an environment where women uh, feel uh, um, supported. Yeah? You need to have uh, maybe a mentoring program for them, or you need to, read to to help them with overcoming their imposter syndrome. Just to make that example a little bit further, or you need to find out ways. What can you do if they if they leave um, for maternal leave or some, for something? How do you how do you make sure that they can come back and and, and st step again in, into the, the position they just left? couple of months ago so that's really important and and if you and maybe also to to hire more women just for the sake of the, the effect that Erica mentioned if you have more women in your own company you might get more uh, possibilities to bring them in leadership positions and um, Erica or Asun from your perspective what would you expect really that men should uh, do and uh, and how they should act to be tangible allies to women well uh, in my point of view uh, i believe it is important to work to change stereotypes okay and make technology more attractive to women i think this is a first step i totally agree with Boris and, and erica they are saying uh, and, and men, in, in my opinion, men must be part of this process, okay? Have to encourage women to choose this technical career when they are in, in the school of previous to the university, but also promoting and, help, and helping them in the companies to reduce this salary gap, one, and to encourage uh, the presence of women in the, in the management position. Today, uh, we have very important reference women leaders in technology. In technology companies such as Google, at Accenture, ABN. So I think that we need to promote this 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 reference in, in the world, and we need to promote the, the the accessing to to the to the woman during the, the professional career to these management positions. And this is part of the men <laughs> for me. I think that the men has a lot of, a, a very important role in this in this process. Mm -hmm. Erika, Erika, your point of view on this question. So I've been reading the chat as we've been going, and I'm really seeing this notion of um, ally and allyship being um, repeated in a number of comments. And uh, like, there are many people that, you know, in a company or an organization, university, wherever you are, that um, likes to identify all of the things that they're doing to help promote, for example, women in leadership or, you know, the positive things as an ally. Um, what I think would really um, kind of help make you know strides uh just in terms of how an ally can support uh women in leadership is to even if you're identifying it as an ally 
what are your what are you doing like that could potentially inhibit uh, women from moving into leadership positions? We don't and not necessarily saying something like, OK, what are the bad things I'm doing? And I'm necessarily not using that value laden like bad or good. But what are things that you could be doing that are inhibiting progress. And the reason for that is, is we may be doing a lot of things unknowingly that aren't necessarily negative in any way, but just from a process uh, or like how we're then creating then the structures in our organizations that really just won't allow women to more easily move into management or leadership positions. And so that what we call is the, you know, the reflective turn, kind of turn it back onto yourself and say, how can I then change those things that are currently inhibiting? What structures am I contributing to that can be, you know, closing the door for um, certain groups in your organization? Thank you. Um, we talked about um, the specific challenges, the differences from younger generation and uh, how men should act and uh, what uh, women should expect from men. Um, putting it in the context of uh, organizations by themselves, uh, um, what should tech companies, especially tech companies, do differently as of now to effectively drive the increase of uh, women's proportion in their employee base and also in, in their leadership? Uh, maybe turning back to, uh, to Asunto on this one. Well, um, tech companies are companies that today are, are fostered the, the innovation, and it is something very attractive for us, for, for women. Uh, uh, mainly the woman that wants to move in the in the world of the technology, you know, in, in the professional career. So um, this this company, the two companies, know okay because they know that women leaders bring diversity of thought, effective communication skills, and strategic vision no? that enrich at the end enrich the decision makings and foster this innovation in the companies. So I think that the, the present of companies in this in this in these companies promote a more inclusive and equitable organizational culture. So uh, in my opinion, what this company have to do, okay, what is what is the, the main points that uh, they uh, they uh, had to, to, to have into account. First is to create a strategic and specific training program, no? Because we have been talking about this coaching, this training, this, this to, to, to be part of the of the of the roadmap of one of one company. Sometimes it's important also to, to do an analysis of bias, okay? Because many companies uh, didn't know that they really have a bias in, in the company. And, and it's important to know to, to try to change. Another is, is promote the and ensure the, the equal pay for equal work. I mean, this is this is one of the, the, the things that we have attended so that we have still today. Increase the employee's engagement. That is for the tech company, it's very easy to do because I think that to go uh, to work with Google or IBM or this type of company is very interesting. It's a it's a challenge for us, it's uh, it's very attractive at least for, for men and, and men. And and the last one is uh, for me, no? in my opinion, is to be able to, to attract. Top talent, okay. I think that is and, and maintain this top talent in the companies, and this is all my opinion. What is your view on this one? Um, yeah, I can only um, agree on all that what Ashun said, and maybe the one aspect I would like to emphasize is the um, creating an environment within the company, but not also within the company. Maybe with the um, the society around you, your, your community, that you that you try to show what what you to be inclusive. Yeah, present more uh, of your your um, I don't know how to say that in the, in the politically correct term. The best people in the organizations that they, they need to go out and and tell the other to, to other people how, how how much fun it is to to work in these inclusive cultures. You need to talk about much more. You need to help um maybe go to universities but not only to university maybe go back into into the elementary schools helping um girls to see um that there is a career in tech for them maybe and um and that might change over time working with your community that you get all these super talent that you would like to have okay thank you and finally maybe erica on this yeah, one short comment um, to build off of that. 
tech companies are losing their talent right at the beginning of their of the pipeline with the with the internships. That's one of the most important findings that we found uh, when we were evaluating this is that as soon as young women at university go into internships in these tech companies, uh, they have a very different experience than the young men. The men are saying, this is life-changing, amazing. This is the best experience. I'm so glad I'm going into this for my career. And the women are almost saying the opposite. And so we're losing that top talent at the beginning. And usually it's for um, you know things that could very easily be fixed as part of the internship program at that tech company. Specifically, like they're getting menial tasks compared to the, the, the men that are also in the internship getting coffee, taking notes, where the men are getting much more technical tasks. And if we then challenge those women right at the beginning and they see that their their um, expertise is just as valued as the men's, uh, then you're going to see strong leadership start to begin over time as we keep those women in the pipeline. I'd like to thank you very much, Asun, Erika, and Boris, for your great contributions. It's been really a pleasure. Um, and before we separate, let me um, uh, gather in maybe our talk in three um, what we collected as input for, for the audience. So we talked about self-empowerment, remove imposter syndrome and biases, and that also men should have a role in empowering women to remove those biases. We talked about training, attracting top talents, uh, growing personally, functionally and, and technically and creating a, uh, an attractive environment. And that's really what the, what the responsibility that we all share, that we all bear as leaders, um, create a strategic perspective in organizations and in society, actively reduce salary gaps, foster the combination of work environment and personal life and personal development. And I'd like to thank you for this, um, for all your insights that we have discussed. Um, I think we are spot on on time. And I will turn back to you, Begonia, for the following of the conversation. Thank you to all. Thank you. So I, I think, yeah, so I think listening to this panel discussion, um, like you all summarized, Stefan, there are many things that we can touch on. Um, but if, if I take like the high level, how, what can I act on now and how can I act on today? I think what it would be is use inclusive language, right? So when you're talking about a technician, make sure you're inclusive and you say it, it can also be a, a male technician or a female technician, right? It can be a female engineer or a male engineer. You know, just using inclusive language really makes a difference and it's something that you can actively do and it changes slowly but surely the mindset of the people around you in a very productive and non-passive aggressive way right so i think that's one of the things that i've taken with me and also to realize that all of us regardless of male um male or female or um members from the LGBTQ community, we all have biases within ourselves and trying to identify the biases, be reflective about oneself and what bias you carry um, also contributes to a, to a world where biases are being diminished step by step, right? And speak up, you know, the time we have a voice, now we have to have the courage to speak up and address issues that we find non-inclusive, address issues that we find um, are not contributing to our growth, right? So I think those are the three takeaways um, for me that I can act on today in my daily day-to-day -day and business in my private environment. So thank you for that. Wonderful. Thank you. thank you for your contribution. It has been an incredible, valuable uh, discussion. We could uh, keep working on that. And I think uh, this uh, uh, how to shape a new narrative. And uh, we speak about uh, language in many different uh, 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 interventions from your part. And uh, I think uh, this is a, a thing about mindset right? How we speak with ourselves, how we speak uh, with others, how we speak in the teams, how we speak in the organization. And uh, the language has an incredible impact in everything we do, because uh, how, we, how we think is reflected on how we, we bring that into 
at the table or into the discussion. So thank you so much for this incredible uh, global perspective as well, uh, speaking about the, uh, the impact of the different countries and having so many different examples in the different continents. And um, we have spoken about South America, about Europe, about the States. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, on stage uh, to the next uh, uh, keynote speakers and uh, incredible uh, human as well joining us uh, um, today from Nigeria. So we will enlarge now the discussion uh, uh, with uh, Tunde Onakaya. So thank you so much, Erika. Thank you so much, uh, Stefano, Asun, and Boris for being here today. And uh, keep on going uh, with the event and uh, let's move into the next uh, point. Tunde. Good morning and uh, happy uh, International Women's Day. Very nice to have you on the stage this morning. I'm really very happy having you today here. And uh, we have met in Munich in January at the DLD conference. And I was so inspired that I was thinking your message deserves the stage of the new phase of leadership because you define yourself as a dreamer and you are a such inspirational leader, understanding inclusion, understanding how to bring humans from the very first stage, we're speaking here about children, how they can discover on themselves the leader they are gonna be in the future, bringing them chess. So, Okay, and Tunde, you are a Nigerian chess master and a social reformer. You founded the Chess in Slums Africa in 2018 to empower children from poor environments through chess, education, and mentorship. Your initiative has made a global impact, reaching over 10,000 children and granting over 500 scholarships. You are a real role model. You have started with a very humble mindset and positioning and just doing, being an ally for children with a clear advocacy that has earned an international recognition, including prestigious awards like the Future Award Africa. Thanks to your Chess in Slums Africa, you embody the transformative power of a strategic thinking for a brighter future. And this is everything what we want to shape, a brilliant future together. So thank you for being here. This is your stage. Happy to listen to you. Well, thank you so much, Bagonia. Thank you for having me. Uh, and um, I mean, I'm happy to share uh, my story and my journey with uh, everyone listening. Um, um, kudos to the other speakers. It's such a great honor to uh, be able to speak amongst uh, you guys and uh, be able to share the little knowledge that I have, you know, on leadership. Um, so thank you once again, Begonia, for the opportunity. Um, it was great seeing you in Munich, and it's so great to see you online now. Um, yeah, so leadership, um, it's such an interesting word because... Um, especially for me and where I come from, you know, I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. I've lived most of my life here in Lagos, Nigeria. And, um, you know, and Africa at large, you know, Africa has a leadership problem, right? And it really begs the question, what kind of leaders do we need? What kind of leaders can take us to the future that Africa truly deserves? What kind of leadership do we need to build shared prosperity? Right. And these are questions that I asked myself um, six years ago uh, um, when we wanted to start the Chess and Slums project. Right. It was what kind of leader do I want to be? And I think this is the first real realization that everyone must come to that we can all be leaders in our own different capacities. Leadership doesn't have to come with a title. Right. What we need to understand is the kind of influence that we have in our circle within our immediate capacity. That is the first true definition of leadership, that you can influence something immediately within that sphere of influence that you have, and you can change something 
and do something meaningful with it. So I kept asking myself this question, what kind of leader do I want to be within my own capacity, right? And the first real determinant of that is understanding what you can do, what is in your hands, what is that one thing that you have that most other people do not have, right? What is that one thing that makes you unique as a person? Because before you can set set out on that journey of leadership, of leadership, you have to know thyself. And it's interesting that today is International Women's Day, and maybe I will draw like a quick analogy to chess. You know, um, and for those that don't play chess, sorry, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. You know, in the game of chess, um, the coin is the most powerful piece. Right? It has a value of nine points. Uh, we have the pawns. The pawns are like the little men. They have each have a value of one point. So there are eight pawns on the chessboard on both sides. And, you know, the, the pawn has a value of one point. Now, there's a castle. You can also call it the rook. It has a value of five points. Then you have the knight. The knight has a value of three points. The knight is the one that looks like a horsey. And the bishop also has a value of, of three points. Then the king is invaluable. And this means, like, during the course of the game, the moment the king gets captured, you cannot quantify it. The game is over, right? So one would imagine that the king should be the most powerful piece, you know, but it's simply not the most powerful piece. It's the queen, right? The queen is powerful because she has a lot of freedom on the chessboard, and that is what defines its strength, right? You know, it, it almost has no constraints. It can move vertically, horizontally, and diagonally. But there's an interesting story here. And it is the story of the pawn, right? The pawn is the least valuable piece, which has a value of just one point. And that seems almost insignificant to the outcome of the game. In fact, the, the pawn is, is the piece that is dispensable, right? But then there's something about the pawn, you know, that makes it special. And that is the only ability that he has that no, no other piece on the board has. It's the power to transform, right? So when the pawn moves down the board, and it gets to the final rank, right? It undergoes a transformation. In chess, we call it pawn promotion. And that transformation takes it from being, you know, that little pawn to becoming a queen, the most powerful piece on the chessboard, right? And in most cases during the game of chess, when you're able to get your pawn to the final rank, you, of course, you have a much higher chance of winning the game. So the story of the pawn, you know, it's an interesting one because it's the story of becoming. And that, uh, that is what I believe the story of leadership should be, right? In our different capacities as, as leaders, you know, our journey is still constantly unfolding, right? The pawn is going to face many obstacles on its path to reaching the final rank because there are 32 pieces on the chessboard. So for that one pawn to be able to march all the way down, it is going to face a lot of hurdles, right? So how do you get the pawn to the final rank so it can become and reach its truest potential? Right, there are a lot of things that the pawn has to, to um, to to have, right. And these are some of the things I'll discuss. And again, tracking this back to the new kind of leaders that we need, you know. And um, so six years ago, when I asked myself that question, like, what kind of leader do I want to be, and what mountain am I going to climb? Then I decided that we're going to go to like the fundamental building block of any society which is empowering the children, right? Giving these children a sense of purpose in a world that has constantly maligned them and excluded them, you know, from participating, you know, in, in, in that future. So it was, how can we take these children practically from zero to one? And what kind of leadership is needed to do this? Because you're trying to solve a hard problem. In Nigeria alone, there are 20 million children out of school Right, with no semblance of education. What this means is, in a world that is, you know, rapidly evolving, 20 million children will be a, will become a liability to that future. So, how do we redefine that by using chess as a tool to give them a beginning in education? And how do you lead this with as much empathy that would compel people to believe in the dreams of this? children and give them the resource that they need to thrive. So these are questions I constantly asked myself and started to optimize for, right? And the first thing I got to really learn, right, is empathy, right? This is the cornerstone of leadership for, um, cornerstone um, gift for any leader, 
The leader must lead with empathy, must be able to take the perspective of others, right? Take it very seriously and act in that, right? And empathy is a gift, right? And it's a gift that is learned over time, right? So being able to lead with empathy, right? To help the world understand, you know, um, the, the, the problems, right? In a way that doesn't demean the people you're serving, right? There are always two ways to solve a problem. You can either solve it by trying to demean the people you're advocating for, or you can solve it in a way that spotlights their potential or their strength, right? So, of course, I chose the latter because it's important that as we're working with these children, we're highlighting their strengths. We're highlighting their story of becoming. Just like the pawn, you know, that seems almost invaluable, can march on against all odds and become, you know, the very powerful queen you know, and attain, you know, the freedom that it needs to operate at, at, at its true potential on the chessboard, right? So it's empathy, right? And leading an em with empathy, with a lot of heart and grace, you know, it's one of those true virtues of leadership that you need to build anything meaningful. Um, so um, we set out on this journey six years ago, you know, and six years down the line, we've been able to impact the lives of so many young people. And I believe that we're building a future that includes all of us, right? And that inclusion is one that we must understand on a, on a much deeper level. There's no future worth dreaming of if it isn't inclusive of everyone. Everyone has to have a place in that future. And that is what we should continue to optimize for, you know, in, in within our different spheres of, of, of influence, that we're building a future that feels inclusive, where nobody's excluded because of their gender, the color of their skin, or where they come from. Right, because if we if we don't address this, then we continue to feed into the dangers of the single story, the dangers of you know stereotypes, right? And the danger of the single story isn't that it is untrue, but it is incomplete, right? And if we continue to feed into that narrative of the single story, we we'll exclude more and more people, and we don't want to live in a future where you know there are people that do not have a place in it. Because what happens is they become a liability to that future. And there's no society that would function, you know, with, without giving as many people as possible that sense of belonging. So um, another thing I would like to um, emphasize on is um, having a purpose-driven vision as a leader. Um, and I'm using myself as an example because this is how I think about what I do in the grand scheme of things, right? It's just chess. It said at the beginning, you know, of the chess and sums project. Well, why are you teaching chess to children in poverty, right? Shouldn't the first priority for children in poverty be food? Like just give them food or just something to help them survive. You know, why teach them chess? What is the benefit of that to them? And at the time, it was such a hard question to answer because I had complete faith in this idea that, you know, you can give a man fish today and he'll be hungry tomorrow. But when you teach a man how to fish, you know, he finds a way, you know, to, 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 to make his own living. And that is the greatest gift you can ever give anyone, right? You give them a way, you know, um, to, to earn and you give them a way um, to build the future or the life that they want for themselves rather than just giving handouts. So to me, it was if we can use chess as a way to enhance cognition for these children, give them an opportunity to dream, give them a way to, to be empowered you know, in a way that they can become thinkers and think for themselves, then you've given them a gift of a lifetime, right? And that was the purpose for the idea that I had. It wasn't because I wanted to solve immediate problems, right? And even in the game of chess, it's understanding the dichotomy between tactics and strategy, right? You can play immediate tactics, maybe in, in a given position to try to score an advantage, but deep strategy takes like the long-term approach to understand, okay, this is what the position looks like now. What do I want the position to look like in the next 10 months? So a good master can, you know, can envisage that for that far, for as far as like 10 moves ahead, you know, even sometimes 15 moves ahead. And that requires a lot of complex thinking. So again, the um, leadership must be driven with purpose. There has to be purpose that isn't obvious, you know, um, um, 
that isn't obvious at the given time, right? So the purpose for what we set out to do was to create a future, again, that includes all of us, that we can raise a new generation of thinkers, even from the slum communities, that we can raise a new generation of children that can be intellectuals. We can raise a new generation of young people that would challenge the status quo and solve Africa's biggest problems, turn Africa's biggest problems into global opportunities, right? Because if we can raise this new generation of young people, they would have deep empathy for the same places that they come from, right? So the real leaders, you know, they must emerge from the communities that they must serve. It is important because there's a connection to that pain that they understand on a much more intimate level. All right, so I had a purpose for this idea of using chess as a tool to help raise a new generation of thinkers because I believe that if we can do that, then we can achieve critical mass where a million children across slum communities in Africa that are empowered enough, you know, to be educated, they're empowered enough to have, you know, skills to enable them compete in the global markets, then they now have that sense of duty and responsibility to their own communities. And this is how we can truly build prosperity, right? So that was the purpose. And it was driven that by that vision that if we can give the gift of church to a million children, then we can empower a whole new generation of thinkers from the worst places, you know, and uh, that is how we can truly change the world, right? So, um, on a final note, um, um, adaptability and resilience, you know, and a lot of like leadership, you know, to be honest, is it, trusting your intuition, right? And I remember the the match between um, uh, Magnus Carlsen, the world chess champion, and uh, Fabiano Carana a couple of years back. So Fabiano Carana was the challenger to the to the world champion, you know, at the time, Magnus Carlsen from Norway. And Fabiano Carana was from America. And they played a classical match of about, I think, 12 games. And it all ended in a draw. Like they played for days and it just ended in a draw, right? And what happens in the championship cycle like that is when all the classical matches end in a draw, they go into much faster time controls. Now, the faster time control could be like a 10 minutes rapid rapid time um, time control uh, against like the typical one hour, 30 minutes in the classical, right? And so what this means is that you have very limited time to make decisions. And when it got to that time control, of course, the world champion, Magnus Carlsen, you know, he excelled. He won very easily. I went on to win, to win, to win the championship. Now, the thing that made Magnus Carlsen different is because... At classical level, both of them were almost evenly matched at strength. Magnus Carlsen had really strong intuition. I don't think there's any player in the history of chess that has that kind of like intuitive understanding of chess with very limited time. So trusting your intuition is the one thing that can help you excel as a leader. And I've been in that situation a lot of times, right? Where we're like innovating a new approach to social intervention. Right, we're innovating a new approach to um, giving children new opportunities. Right? So a lot of that is being able to adapt um, um, to, to the transitions, being able to adapt to the communities, of the communities that we're working with, right, and making sure that we can still stage meaningful interventions, you know, for the children in their community, and that is how you know leaders um, employ like effective ways to solve their own problems. Right. And um, so on a final note, uh, I would like to say this again, leadership, leadership is it has to be deeply rooted in empathy, empathy for the people that we serve, because the new faces of leadership have a responsibility to build a future that includes all of us. Right. A future that is morally driven, not just for profit, but for purpose, because without purpose, um, it is it is almost impossible to see that far ahead. We need to have a purpose for our vision and for the people that we serve. And this is how we can truly create a world that we can share in that prosperity, a world that truly, truly includes all of us. And I believe I'm playing my part through the Chess and Sums project, you know, by helping children from these forgotten places to find their own place in the world with their own ability, a world where they will be defined by their abilities and not by what they look like or where they're from. So thank you very much.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tunde, for this uh, such inspiring and really very deep keynote you have prepared for today. I love the uh, comparison you have done with chess and the different uh, pieces on the, uh, uh, on, the, on the game. And at the end of the day, we can relate a lot, right, from many different sources on how to become the leader we want to be. Thank you for this ins inspiration. Thank you for this crucial question for all of us in the audience today and tomorrow and every day. What kind of leader I want to be? And uh, having said that, uh, I would like to pass over uh, the word and the voice to Katarina, who is going to present the next uh, panel discussion. Uh, we are a little bit over the time, very little bit, but please um, stay there. Thank you, Tunde, for being today with us. Keep on going. We are going to have a great story to tell about the new phase of leadership. And this is uh, just the beginning of a long journey. Thank you. Katerina, it's your stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tunde, also thank you from my side. It was really inspiring. Um, and uh, now we are going to our next panel uh, about intersectional um, perspective into leadership and um, I am uh, happy to introduce you um, Cecile de Perez. Um, she, uh, um, uh, Cecile is um, a researcher in the field of uh, satellite positioning GPS at German Space Center DLR in Munich. Cecile has developed a number of activities relating to diversity and inclusion as um, the co-founder of uh, several uh, groups uh, at DLR for women and um, LGBTQIA plus people. Since 2022, Cecile has been active as a speaker on topics such as sexism, microaggressions, uh, um, LGBTQIA plus community, and um, communicating uh, science. For women in aerospace Europe, Cecile coordinates a research group on uh, visibility of women experts at STEAM, as well as development of a new intersectionality focus group and um, proposes monthly book reviews um, for the Digest. Cecile is co-founder um, of association uh, Success Flop, um, the Belgian branch um, of uh, Pepet uh, uh, Success uh, sexist, uh, which expose the use of um, sexism in advertising. Um, Cecile, stage is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Katerina. I'm really happy to be um, here today with uh, an amazing panel. And before we start, I just wanted to, oh, my cat says hi too. Um, I just <laughs> wanted to <laughs> say a word about um, intersectionality and what is it exactly. So I will just try to share one picture with you. Um, here. So I don't know, can you see my screen? Can you just show your thumbs up? Ah, okay, someone has to authorize it. Oh, no one in backstage, okay. Well, let's go without the screen let's then. Let's go without. And so intersectionality um, is the idea that we are living in a society in which we have different social identities. So um, I wanted to show you the wheel of power and privilege. You might be familiar with it. Uh, it shows actually at the center of the wheel all the different social identities in which um, we have the most power and privilege in the Western society. So for instance, people who are born in a rich um, class, which are white, which are heterosexual, uh, which uh, look slim, we are, which are cisgender, a opposition to uh, queer or transgender. So um, all these uh, people would have in our society the more privilege. And then the further you go away from the center of this wheel of privilege uh, and power, uh, the less power obviously you have. And so um, intersectionality is the idea that if you're a woman, but you also come from a very poor neighborhood and you happen to be lesbian, you will be confronted with several types of discrimination. Several 
Um, so not only sexism, but you will also uh, feel like classism. You will also feel maybe homophobia or les lesbophobia. So all these different social identities that you have will have an impact on your life and how you are perceived by others and what you can actually reach um, in, in life. So this was just the introduction to what intersectionality is about and what we're going to talk about in this panel. And I would like then to introduce my guests. Um, so Dr. Irene Kilubi, um, she's the founder and the managing director of Brand Pruners and Brand Fluencers. She supports pioneers, visionaries, and change makers in the three subjects area of community building, corporate influencer strategy, and connecting uh, Gen uh, X, Y, and Z. She spent several years in companies such as BMW, Siemens, and Deloitte. For four years now, she has been anchored in the startup and yeah, online startup. scene, implementing social selling activities and uh, implementing target group oriented go to market and branding strategies. She is also she an expert okay. advisor to the European Innovation Council Accelerator of the European Commission. Arin has a video cast, How to Community, in which she offers her audience insight into community building. She is responsible for the LinkedIn local community in Munich, uh, co-author of the Spiegel bestseller uh, Zukunftsrepublik, and recently released a book, Du bist mehr als uh, ein Zahl. Sorry for my German, not so good. Uh, then we have Alan Davidson. Uh, Alan is founder and CEO of his company, Across Media, Alan hosts and produces Sunbites, the award-winning nationally broadcast CBS News technology radio show he created 34 years ago and which has given him an insider view of the tech industry since its inception. Alan created patented software that Google later brought uh, a boat from him, uh, funded and ran a marketing tech firm that supplied many of the top names in international and US business, from Apple and Cisco to ADP and American Express. Um, table 414, Alan's latest project, will shortly launch and uh, on an old major podcast platform with a focus uh, on the human side of innovator uh, and innovation. So stay tuned. Uh, then we have our last panelist, Gretchen uh, Nemechek. So Nemechek is correct, the way of pronouncing it? Yes. Okay. So um, she's uh, the uh, opinary founder and she's well known for her empathetic and connected approach to leadership centered on driving accountability and bringing out the best in people to unlock their finest work. During her 25 years of working Five with high performance working teams working. at SAP and various successful startup and scale up B2B software businesses, she experienced firsthand the positive impact of human centered leadership and the challenges leaders face in implementing sustained organizational change. So, Gretchen, I would like to start with asking you a question. You've been working for more than 24 years. 25 years with executive uh, and leaders, helping them identify blocking points within their organization. Is mm. diversity a topic that you tackle with them? Absolutely. Um, diversity and inclusion is absolutely a topic that gets tackled because really, I think at the end of the day, if I boil it down to the most um, essential element is that when we show up as the best versions of ourselves, we are naturally more empathetic. We are naturally more connected to other people. We are naturally, um, you know, checking our own biases, our own egos, our own predisposed ideas of things. And so <clears throat> a lot of the work that I do is helping people get a lot more in touch with the best versions of themselves and figuring out why and when they don't show up as the best versions of themselves. And when we start to embrace that, we start to dissolve a lot of those biases, a lot of those um, uh, behaviors, which are not constructive, unproductive, and exclude people from having a seat at the table. Because all of those exclusion behaviors are really rooted in fear. It's fear and misunderstanding. And so when people start to become aware of this inside themselves, it's a lot easier for them to start approaching, um, you know, people who are different than them with compassion and understanding and welcoming and seeing what value they have to add and that it's not um, a zero sum game. It's not an either or it's not, you know, my cookie or your, your cookie. We can share it. <laughs> oh, you're muted again, Cecile. 
Sorry. Um, no I wanted to ask you, like when you do this job, do you see a switch over the years uh, between the approach towards diversity that is more like gender based uh, to a more intersectional approach? Yes, definitely. Because the the issue with, you know, when we're not the best versions of ourselves, when we embrace these biases, when we are not aware of them, because a lot of them, you know, are unconscious. Um, when we start to become aware of them, it is a lot easier to start to see that they exist on multiple levels, that it's not just sort of, you know, male versus female, but rather it extends to all flavors, as you said, from an intersectional approach, all flavors of things that make us different from one another. And, you know, when I talk with leaders about intersectionality, you know, we can look at the top you know, sort of the top view, which is, you know, we start with gender maybe, and then we go to race, and then we go to, um, uh, you know, uh, LGBTQIA identification. We talk about neurodiversity, we talk about economic diversity, educational diversity, and also then something that often gets overlooked in the process is our own thoughts and motivational diversity, right? A lot of times teams have a very, you know, um, uh, non-diverse team from a thinking perspective and this this is a part of our intersectionality but it is not the only thing and so when we start to look at how do we embrace all of these things we can start to see ah you know the colors of the rainbow are you know it's not just even this the the specific colors that we see the red uh orange yellow green blue purple we see also the full spectrum of the nuance in each of these colors as well and we can start to really um, open ourselves into the value that having this spectrum of, of personas, identities, um, you know, thinking is, um, is to business. Yes, definitely. I think it's really important. We were talking yesterday about the, like this picture, right? Mm -hmm. this, with like all the people at the table that have exactly like the same appearance, the same t-shirt and they're like, oh, yes. um, any new ideas here? And like, it's really <laughs> hard when we, we are all like coming from the same culture and, and yes. it's actually way better. Same when educational you know. background, same, you know, same family type, you know, it's, it. you don't get that diversity of thought. You, it, it limits creativity, it limits innovation, and it limits you know, creating an environment that um, can be achieving its highest potential, really. Yeah, maybe Irene, you would like to jump in here. Like, uh, I understand that you're also an expert on age-related discrimination, so ageism, um, from your latest book. Uh, could you tell us also what it looks like at work and how this is important to consider it? Yes, when we talk about age discrimination, we have to uh, think of two sides. On the one hand side, young people who can be discriminated because um, they might be perceived as being too young to take on responsibility or to make the right decisions. On the other hand side, we have the elder people who might be perceived as not uh, possessing the cognitive um, skills anymore to learn new competencies or even to not possess them anymore. So when we look at the complete employee life cycle journey, we have to start from recruiting, onboarding, to think of like when we are trying to attract new talents, do we also consider elder people based on the job description, based on the communication channels that we are using? Are we targeting them and reaching them? And along the employee life cycle journey, we have many different stations. Uh, it can be uh, related to the salary, to the um, further development progress, because studies have shown, for example, that companies tend to invest more money in the education of younger people than they do for older people. And uh, we can go on and on like that, also considering career progression. Um, people over 50, do they have the same opportunities as people um, aged 30 have? And it um, all ends with the offboarding process. Do I show appreciation if somebody has spent several years in my company and wants to retire? What do I do with this knowledge, this valuable knowledge that has accumulated over the year? You know, this is complex. There are many different areas where age discrimination might occur. So company leaders are asked to um, provide the relevant working conditions and frames so that everyone uh, irrespective of their age feel comfortable and valued yeah and still have perspective right because this is this is a, another aspect 
Yeah, really interesting. And also this aspect of knowledge transfer, actually, this is essential for mm -hmm. any uh, any big company. I assume like if people here are in leadership yeah, position, this is something that they have to tackle, um, like how to share, transfer the knowledge from, from people who were there before to the younger generation. Do you have mm -hmm. any, any advice on how to integrate better this perspective of having different generation working together? What would you say mm -hmm. to people who are in leadership position listening today on what they could actually I actively do to tackle okay. this? Yes, absolutely. It starts with um, overcoming prejudices, creating awareness. Um, it's not only about um, having holding some dialogues one day, generation day, whatsoever. It's about really working together. If I look at the innovation labs, for example, entrepreneurship entities of companies, you only mostly see young people, but really to see like it's very um, important for the productivity and innovativeness for, of companies to involve all the perspectives. So um, companies can implement, for example, reverse mentoring where young and older employees can work together um, over several months and um, also work towards a common goal because studies have also shown that the values and expectations of different age groups are not so different. Only the way to get there might be different, right? So another thing might be also job tandems, right? Having one young employee with an older employee working on innovative projects, for example, um, there are several others also job shadowing. This is something that um, Telecom has implemented. They have the traditional uh, board, but still have a younger board that um, is being heard before any decision is taken. Right? And there are also many, many measures in terms of knowledge and um, competency transfer that companies can implement. And I really, really um, recommend companies to make sure that it's not only um, a dialogue from time to time, but really working together also on an innovative projects. Because it, at the end of the day, it also reflects the clients over there. We are facing a demographic change, right? So all services and products should also reflect um, the population and the target groups out there. Yeah, it makes complete sense. And that goes like for, for all old people actually like we really need to reflect everybody in the society otherwise it wouldn't work thank you very much um, um alan, you, alan you you're working on technologies um how would this um support uh, diversity in the workplace like for the recruitment or how would this downweight it like is technology something that can be like really biased in recruiting a diverse crowd of people or actually could it be helping also leaders to get more diversity in their teams You you are muted. Sorry about that. Um, I, it's a good question. I I think Steve Jobs had it right many years ago when he launched an advertising campaign called Think Different, and that's kind of the starting point. I think is that you got people intuitively recognized at the time that it was valuable, that this was a good thing. And think different really, to me, comes down to intersectional relation, uh, leadership. It's, it's the heart of it. The idea that diversity um, can bring much better ideas, that can generate better solutions. And it's more than that, because uh, if you have diversity, if you have acceptance of the diversity and consider it a virtue, that thinking different, then the result is also social harmony, which matters. It matters a lot. Um, and so you, you think about where's the problem? Well, I think a lot of the problem in organizations um, is one that, that, that technology can't solve, at least not on its own. Um, it's something that, that Erica talked about before, this idea of sort of, well, I guess you could call it hidden bias. Um, it is, it's the, the inertia in organizations. Well, that's the way we've always done it. And um, that bureaucratic, inertia and the, the personal inertia of people's own biases affect how things are seen and what can be done. The goal, obviously, is ideally people would be hired on merit, and that's where there's the potential for AI, for technology to help, I think. Um, <clears throat> but these are tools. And ultimately, all of these AI systems, um, do not they project to the future 
what has been happening in the past. And that's the danger. That's the danger because if you start to project to the future um, the things that have worked in the past, what you end up with is bias, the bias that's embedded in those past decisions. Now, uh, just to give you some idea here of the problem, about 10 years ago, I spoke with a friend of mine who was ran, who ran HR um, in the U.S. Um, for a company with half a million employees. So a lot of people. It was well over half a million people. And uh, it was really an eye-opener because already at that time, nobody was looking at resumes anymore. Everything was done by scanning, and people were chosen by inputting keywords um, in, the, in the computer. Uh, they were anybody that sent in a picture with their resume was automatically rejected because they felt they could be sued for discrimination. That was just one example or many other things like that. Um, and of course, if you're looking at defining by keywords and so on, you're basically always going to end up reflecting the decisions that were made in the past, not thinking about what they are in the future. Um, and your, your job descriptions will reflect the past, not the future. So uh, you've got to think very, very carefully about this. One other sort of thought that was, that was interesting, um, when you talk about bias and jobs and opportunity, um, I found a couple of articles yesterday, coincidentally, it came up yesterday. One was of someone that had applied for a job and they were interviewed by an AI system. There wasn't even a human being in the conversation. They were literally being interviewed by an AI system. So taking out all the humanity and all the human element in the in the job application. And I think that matters um, in the same sense that you went around to to having um, re companies that that you know posted job searches and matched people. And now you find in that second article that there are companies using AI to spam resumes. And you know what? The journalists that tested it got much better results through the, those systems than she had had writing custom resumes that were focused on the companies and manually contacting them one by one. That's scary because that means people are just a commodity and it totally discourages any kind of diversity. Um, and I, I think Erica touched on that problem too. Uh, I think it was Erica um, in, in saying that, you know, it was the bias of, of seeing oneself as the best solution or the most logical solution when looking at, at candidates. So is AI going to be tech uh, and tech um, that, that exists already, traditional tech, going to be faster and cheaper? Yes, um, that can be good and bad, but it certainly inherits the bias. And when you see AI going, um, it's going to trigger a lot of layoffs. And those, if you think about it, will historically have always been um, something that puts uh, minorities out of work first. Those are the first people to get laid off. And if the AI barrier that we're talking about is real, then it's going to make it much harder for those minorities to get uh, rehired. So that's kind of my my take on a lot of this. Um, and worth a lot of thought, I think. Ketchen, I, wanted to comment. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to comment because I think what Alan just said was re really important about um, layoffs hitting uh, minorities disproportionately first, and that. The, the barrier or the, the gap that exists then between AI and then also um, minorities finding work again. I, I wanted to bring that back to the topic that Irene was talking about, which is this ageism topic, because what I see in the market right now is that the layoffs are often disproportionately hitting more senior people in an organization. And we think about ageism, like we used to think, oh, you know, 65 and older, 70 year olds. I'm talking 49 year olds. I'm talking 50 year olds. I'm talking people in their, you know, really what we'd say in the prime of their life who are being let go from a lot of these major organizations who are having really a difficult time finding work in this current climate. And, and AI is certainly contributing to the decisions that the companies are making to um, reduce numbers and change strategies, but also in the decisions they're making not to rehire or onboard people who are later in their careers due to cost, due to, um, you know, 
that level of expertise not being valued anymore. Oh, we can just focus. We need to focus on expertise that's coming from a different area. And so I think this, you know, to use the word intersection, we're at this intersection of where we're, we're seeing the technology really impacting how people are um, being considered for roles. And, and it starts with the recruiting process, as you said, Alan, you know, I, I read a few years ago that there was um, a report, a study done on how, and this is even before a lot of the latest Gen I advancements, that when resumes were being scanned by these services, women and minorities were disproportionately being thrown out early because they don't use the same language and the same adjectives to describe the work that they do that men do and that the that that typically the adjectives being used to describe themselves in CVs by men are are more dominant and those are how a lot of the scanning tools are programmed and so you know softer squishier terms that might get used by other people um, you know, are just being tossed out and tossed aside. And so there's really this, I think it's an important time that we're in exactly for all the reasons Alan said, to really look hard at, at how, what the impact is and how we shift this going forward. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for this additional insight. Um, actually, we are already almost at the end of the time of the panel. That was really short. Um, I wish we could continue the conversation, but I would like maybe to ask you all um, to conclude um, just a note about what you would say to convince people to, um, like Gretchen, the work you're doing, like it's like bettering yourself by considering people, by, by uh, like working on your empathy. Some people are really reluctant in doing this. They want to keep doing their way. What would be, for the three of you, the advice that you would give in one or two sentences um, to people to make them realize how important that is and, and how great it could be also if everyone was working like this? I, I'll just start since I was the last one. And um, the, the I think the biggest thing is it always starts with us. And I think the challenge is a lot of people don't see that they're also vulnerable, right? So I have a lot of people that I'm working with who thought a few years ago they would never find themselves vulnerable for a layoff, you know, uh, you know, middle-aged white men in the prime of their career who are now facing ageism, you know, related discrimination. And, and I think when we start to realize that it really starts with us, it starts with our own personal growth, we can start to see how our shifting our view, shifting our empathy, becoming more compassionate can help bring about this inclusive change across all areas of what we do. Yep. Thank you. Maybe Irene, like one last word and then uh, Alan, we really are short in time, so we have to conclude. Irene, go right ahead. Oh, Alan, if you just want to. Okay, well, I will just, I'll just go ahead. Um, I, I, I can only second what Gretchen is saying. I think we're going to see a lot of layoffs, particularly in white collar type jobs. And that implicitly will probably mean older people um, or certain um, specific targeted groups. That will be very unfortunate, be very difficult to, to reverse. So okay. um, best mm -hmm. idea should always win. Most talented people should win. Up to us okay. to program the tools to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Irene, to conclude? Yes, sorry, I had some issues unmuting myself. Well, um, I feel that um, in the very near future, uh, companies will not have any other alternative than integrating older people into the workforce. So they have to start now because there was a Deloitte study a couple of years ago that found out that more than 70% of organizations worldwide truly believe that there's a value add of age diverse teams. However, they lack the knowledge and experience on how to do it. So I really appeal to everyone here um, to think of measures to implement and to uh, seek for advice and help if they don't know what to do, because um, everyone who thinks age diversely will be um, competitive in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great insight and thank you for joining this panel. I hand over to you, Begonia. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm so grateful that we have this uh, topic. Even if there is a short conversation, we have such a major and impactful takeaways from your expertise. 
And thank you, Irene, because at the end of the day, this is everything about how to do that, right? How we can implement it. And um, with your book, we are going to learn more with, uh, we are more than one number. And uh, this is something that I recommend also everyone to start thinking about how to be active on promoting myself. It doesn't matter how old I am and how to support others to really succeed in the organizations independently, uh, how old they are. And um, we are now invited on a stage, Annabelle. And I know we are short in time. Thank you to uh, Irene. Thank you to Cecile for providing this uh, fantastic moderation on the topic. Thank you, Adam, for uh, being here with us. And uh, thank you, Retin, to provide your knowledge. And um, Annabelle is amazing. We have seen yesterday in Berlin. Today is a very exciting day in Berlin. At a holiday day actually so we are really celebrating i put my uh, great uh, t-shirt as well like uh, having a kind of empowerment of myself saying yes although that uh, to be honest i celebrate every day and uh, i would like to provide the stage for you right away because uh, i know the time is precious and you have a very important keynote to to uh, uh, share with us. So I will leave you to introduce yourself. You are an amazing woman, a futurist, an expert on sustainability, and uh, a crime and a, yeah, a partner of crime for me in the national and international environment. So thank you for being here today with us, and uh, the stage is yours. Oh, you are unmuted. We can hear you. No. Try it again. Oh, I cannot. Uh, we cannot hear you. I don't know why. Uh, maybe you go in and out again. Hello. And then. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? No. Wonderful. <laughs> You're in. <laughs> okay, it's a huge pleasure for me to uh, speaking today, Begonia, and it was already a pleasure for me to meeting you yesterday on talking at FKR um, about diversity, so introducing the World Women's Day already. So uh, thank you very much to, uh, for, uh, to giving me the time for some closing words. And I'm super happy to uh, celebrate with you today, the World Women's Day. Yes, and Bolan, it's a day off, um, which, is, uh, which is just reserved to celebrate this day. But it's not, of course, about one day a year. It is about ongoing uh, challenges we have to face. And it's about ongoing tasks we have to solve. And it's something we only can do together. And uh, just let me um, let me say a few words about that. I think we have to kind of unlocking the code. So achieving gender equality and leadership needs some more than just a job. Um, and as we embark on our exploration of achieving a gender equality and leadership, a pivotal central question emerges: What is preventing us from achieving gender parity and leadership? It is first, I think, unconscious biases. So one prominent independent lies in the realm of unconscious biases that subtly influence decision-making processes. These biases deeply ingrained in our social norms, and you just said, or you just mentioned AI, uh, which we have to take into concern there very much, tend to favor traits and traditionally associated with masculinity. From recruitment to promotions, these biases create an invisible barrier that hinders their recognition and advancement of women in leadership. And then, of course, structural barriers, beyond biases, structural impedance, without organizations perpetrate the gender gap, limited access to mentorship, biased performance evaluations, and unequal opportunities for career advancement among the structural barriers that need dismantling. Addressing these foundational issues is crucial for creating an environment where leadership opportunities are generally equal for all. And then, of course, cultural expectation, um, cultural expectations, cultural and societal expectations play a pivotal role in shaping perceptions of leadership. Predefined gender roles and stereotypes influence career choices and hinder women's progression into leadership positions, but as well also groups um, 
uh, which are um, here in these positions uh, where it came it comes to often um, yeah some hindering reasons just an age, just as age or also the country you're from. Overcoming these cultural expectations requires a collective effort to challenge and redefine social norms surrounding leadership, of course. So um, we see that there's a lot to do. And what is the path to a bright future through diversity? I think a diverse leadership team brings a wealth of perspectives, experience, and innovative ideas. And uh, as we set the stage for an impactful event and celebration of International Women's Day, the theme Inspire Inclusion emerges as a guiding vision, illuminating the path towards a more diverse and equal world. This event is not just a commemoration, but a call to action, a platform where inspiration meets empowerment. And there's a collective recognition of the transformative power of inclusion. It draws from the stories of resilient women who have shattered glass ceilings, the allies who have championed equality, and the vibrant mosaic of voices that make up our diverse global community. So what are our objectives? Celebrate diversity. We should really celebrate the rich tapestry of diversity by highlighting the achievements and contributions of women, but also people from various backgrounds, professions, ages, and works of life. It is a celebration that goes beyond gender, as I said, embracing the intersectionality of identities. Empower through knowledge. Promote allyship. Catalyze conversations. Ignite action and forge a collective vision. We should forge a collective vision of a world where diversity is not just celebrated on specific occasions, but embedded in the fabric of every day's life, where every voice is heard and every individual has an equal opportunity to thrive. As we embark on this journey, Inspire Inclusion encapsulates the spirit of International Women's Day, transforming it into a catalyst for change. And so I'm very happy to say what I think that leadership is in the modern area, just not something we understood it in the past. It demands a paradigm shift, a transcending traditional notions and embracing a new face that mirrors the diversity of our global society. It can transcend and should transcend stereotypes, championing a leadership style that values collaboration over hierarchy and innovation over conformity. Organizations must actively seek leaders who embody these qualities, creating a leadership landscape that is a diverse asset challenges it seeks to overcome. Cultivating inclusive corporate cultures requires a multifaceted approach. It involves reevaluating organizational values, policies, and practices to ensure the align with the principles of diversity and inclusion. Training programs, awareness campaigns, and active efforts to eliminate biases become essential components and fostering an environment where individuals of all backgrounds can thrive. Ultimately, it's about building a culture that celebrates differences, values, every contribution, and empowers individuals to lead authentically. It is a journey towards a more inclusive and resilient future, where leadership reflects the richness of human diversity. Let's start with this today and together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annabelle. There is so much content in your speech. It has been some minutes, I don't know how long, but it has been so much inspiration, so much call to actions, and so much thought, uh, food for thought, actually, because uh, it's related to everything we have said the last two hours so almost together. It's about reflecting what kind of leader I'm going to be. Um, how can I uh, um, foster an inclusive environment where everyone can uh, grow and be themselves and bring the same, the best version of themselves so that uh, at the end of the day, we all together can shape a brilliant future for us, for our children, for our older ones, for everyone who is in this world. So thank you for this contribution. Thank you so much uh, for being here. And uh, um, I would like now to, to leave you go to the next uh, stage and uh, keep, on, keep on going because this journey is like I mentioned before, it just begins today and uh, uh, we are going to be and to keep on discussing and going deeper in this discussion with all those experts we have today. Uh, with the new face of leadership. 
Thank you so much. A pleasure for me to be in here. Uh, let's start today all together. Thank you. Let's start today all together. These are um, your latest uh, words for today. And uh, Katerina, I say bye, Annabel, Katerina. We are now closing uh, the stage and uh, closing these two hours together. I would like uh, to uh, ask everyone who still is on the studio, uh, to uh, join us uh, to have a last picture together. So some of you are still here, which is really great. And uh, I don't know if, uh, um, yeah, I think uh, we had many different perspectives. We had uh, um, incredible speakers with us today. And uh, this is everything about shaping a new phase of leadership, which was exactly um, the title of this event and which is the um, name of the movement we have created with Net for Tech. And before we go right away to the really very end, Katerina, I'd like to uh, uh, listen for you your uh, sums, your summary from the last panel and from this event. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Vigone. It was an um, amazing event for me. Uh, we had over 200 uh, people watching us from different countries, from uh, Finland, Nigeria, UK, Denmark, Germany, and Portugal. It's what I covered in comments. Um, and um, in last panel, I make me a lot of notes and um, Alan uh, spoke about HR and uh, AI um, using for HR pro pro processes. And uh, like many years ago, I was uh, first uh, trying from Amazon to, to use it um, a machine learning for, uh, for AI. And because team was buyers, P a team was only men was there inside. Uh, they pr uh, programmed uh, machine learning so that uh, women uh, or women or some kind of female something um, in, in um, resume was decided as a fail and they put out all women from um, HR process. Um, and um, there is a thing. So if we are uh, biased and we are, uh, I think Gretchen said, uh, non-diverse, um, in, from thinking perspective, how we provide AI, which are will be not biased. So um, uh, it's what it was a pleasure for me. It was uh, really really interesting uh, um, way to start uh, International Women's Day today. Thank you all. Thank you, Katerina. So let's take this uh, celebration today as a catalyst decision, a moment for yourself, for your teams, for your organization to work towards a more diverse, inclusive, um, equi equitable, and uh, also working on the, the aspect of belonging that everyone and all talents are needed and all talents contribute to shape our future together. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you. Uh, today we, we see you still uh, Alan, Stefan, Boris, Gretchen. You are all fantastic humans, fantastic people working as uh, CEOs, as uh, leaders, as entrepreneurs, as uh, humans towards uh, this spirit of the new face of leadership. And uh, for everyone uh, joining us today, we also have uh, an, a call to action for you. And this call to action is be part of the movement. Become the new face of leadership. Think about the leader you want to be and become the leader for yourself, for the others, for your team, for your organization, and be visible with us, joining Netfotech, joining our movement, the new face of leadership, you can join us in uh, LinkedIn. Uh, uh, you can take contact with the experts and uh, with the team. Uh, let us know about your story. Network Tech is your stage, and we need more of those uh, leaders. They align with our vision and with the mission. 
And uh, yeah, we are going to keep on driving these kind of uh, streams. So uh, keep on going, join the newsletter, be aware when we are going to be on stage and uh, uh, raise your voice. We want to see uh, and we want to be contributors of the change we want to be in the world. So thank you for being here again. A nice uh, picture of all of you being here. Irene is also here. Thank you for being here. This is the final picture of everyone already on the stage. And um, yeah, enjoy your day. Enjoy your International Women's Day. And um, happy new phase of leadership. Bye. For me, leadership means to be your authentic self, to sometimes take a risk because we all make mistakes and only if you be your true self, you can be a good leader. That's what I think. To me, leadership is all about motivation and setting a path to reach goals together. For me, leadership isn't something what comes with a certain position or a certain hierarchy level. For me, it's an attitude how you see your role in life. Leadership for me is about inclusion. It's about putting yourself in other people's shoes. It's about understanding the other. It's about communication. Leadership for me is about humanity. Leadership today is about inspiring people. It's about bringing people together. It's about collaboration. It's about inclusivity. For me, leadership means lifting other people, helping other people, supporting other people and um, empowering them to bring out the best talents they bring with them. As for me, leadership is uh, less about rank and seniority and more about being the leader that you feel you need and that people around you may need so that you make sure that you take everyone on your team on the same journey. So, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>